In our second lesson on Chapter 15, Oxidative Phosphorylation, we want to consider mitochondrial transport. Let's look first at the structure of the mitochondrion. On the far left, we have an electron micrograph showing an individual mitochondrion, and the cristae or folds of the inner membrane are highlighted by the black arrows. However, we can't see anything about the three-dimensional structure. For that, we need the electron tomograph shown in the center of our slide. As you can see, the cristae, highlighted in the different colors of blue and green and purple and yellow, and marked by the white arrows, is highly variable in structure, not a regular structure that we might expect in looking at the figure on the left. If we examine the electron micrograph of the fibroblast cell on the far right, we can see the mitochondria actually forms more of a branched network rather than being individual organelles. The mitochondria are highlighted in green here. Let's look, however, at that individual mitochondrion. First of all, we notice it has an outer membrane, and that gives the organelle its shape. It's highly permeable to small molecules and ions. In other words, we do not need transport proteins to move things across that membrane. More internal to the outer membrane is the inner membrane, and this functions more like our lipid bilayers. It is impermeable to most small molecules because it is a highly nonpolar lipid bilayer. This is vital for forming and maintaining the proton gradient that we will accomplish in the process of electron transport. The membrane also carries the components of the electron transport system as well as the ATP synthase that generates ATP and the translocase that moves ADP into the matrix and ATP out. In other words, these are all membrane-bound components. You'll notice the M inner membrane contains many convolutions and that creates multiple folds. That means more surface area, more membrane space, more room in which to incorporate our energy generating machinery. The most internal part of the mitochondrion is the matrix, internal to the inner membrane. It contains oxidation enzymes, except of course glycolytic enzymes, which would be present in the cytosol. It also contains DNA molecules, ribosomes, other enzymes, metallic metabolic intermediates, as well as small molecules and ions. The inner membrane is a very effective barrier and it keeps separate the matrix from the cytosolic components. Lastly, we have the intermembrane space. This is the area between the inner and outer membranes. Remember that outer membrane is highly porous, which means that the concentration of metabolites within the intermembrane space is essentially the same as that of the cytosol. In the figure on the lower left, we have illustrated that the, the fact that these mitochondria are individual organelles within the cell. We might have multiple mitochondria within a given cell. In the center we have the nucleus and we have multiple mitochondria which function as more or less the batteries of the cell to give it the energy it needs to carry on its functions. We next want to notice that we need to move our reduced cofactors, our electron carriers, from the cytosol to within the matrix. This is because these carriers donate their electrons to the electron transport chain on the matrix side. So then we have two options. We can move the carriers across the membrane themselves, but in that case we have different carriers. It might be NADH, NADPH, FADH2, and so if we move the carriers themselves across, we need a different transporter for each carrier. So instead, we transfer the electrons from the carrier to some molecule, and then we transport that molecule across the membrane. In our figure, we have oxaloacetate that becomes reduced to malate. In other words, the electrons are transferred from NADH to oxaloacetate. Malate is then transported through its transporter protein within the matrix. 
And so in this way, whatever our electron carriers, whether it be NADH, NADPH, or FADH2, we can transfer any electrons to oxaloacetate and carry them across the inner membrane through malate. Once inside the matrix, malate can then be reoxidized to oxaloacetate and we reform that reduced electron carrier. In this case, we can use one of the citric acid cycle enzymes, malate dehydrogenase, which of course is already present in the matrix. Now we have our reduced carriers on the right side of our inner membrane. On the matrix side, the oxaloacetate through a series of reactions is converted to aspartate and then transported as aspartate back to the cytosol. This is referred to as the malate aspartate shuttle. Once into the cytosol, we can convert aspartate back to oxaloacetate and it's ready to receive more electrons and transport them to within the matrix. As noted earlier, our ATP synthase enzyme, the enzyme that generates ATP, is also located within the inner membrane and the ATP synthesis occurs within the matrix. If we want to generate ATP from ADP, an inorganic phosphate, then we need to move the substrates from the cytosol, or intermembrane space, to within the matrix. And for that purpose, we need, first of all, a translocase. It's called an a ATP translocase. It imports ADP into the matrix, and once we generate the ATP product, we could move that back out to the inner membrane space and eventually the cytosol. This ATP translocase, as you may notice, functions by that rocker mechanism similar to what we saw for the glucose transporter. We also need inorganic phosphate, and for that we have a symport protein highlighted here in purple. We have the simultaneous movement of inorganic phosphate with proton. As we'll see, this electron transport chain allows us to generate the proton gradient and we're using the energy of that gradient to move one of our substrates, inorganic phosphate, into the matrix. In our next video lesson, we want to examine more particularly complex one of the electron transport system and consider its redox cofactors. We also want to look at how the energy of electron transport is conserved.